So good morning everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Joshua Burke, I'm a Senior Energy and Environment Fellow here at Policy Exchange. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to watch a fantastic event. Ten years on from the Climate Change Act, Successes and Shortfalls. Our panellists today reflect the cross-party consensus on climate change. To my right we have the Right Honourable Ed Miliband, former leader of the Opposition and Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change. Please. Please. Uh, then we have uh, the Right Honourable Baroness Featherstone, the Liberal Democrat spokesman for Energy and Climate Change, the Right Honourable Claire Perry MP, Minister of State for the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and Chris Starr, the Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change. But before we hear from our panellists, I'll provide some context to today's event. So the UK Climate Change Act went through Parliament 10 years ago with cross-party cross support. The Queen gave royal assent on November 26, 2008, signifying political consensus that has preserved ever since. But just as important, although of less notoriety, is June 9, 2008, the day of the second reading in the House of Commons, the money resolution and the programme motion. Ultimately, it was voting on these matters that set forth the successful passage of the Act. And this is the closest we could get to June 9 that our panellists and their diaries committed, so uh, that's why we're here today as opposed to November. So the Climate Change Act enshrined in law, statutory five-year carbon budgets, an independent advisory body to hold the government to account, and mandatory progress monitoring with the aim of reducing carbon emissions by at least 80% from 1990 level by 2050. It was the first law in the world to set statutory greenhouse reduction targets. Furthermore, it placed the UK at the forefront of an international effort to mitigate the adverse impact of climate change providing lessons for climate policy that apply internationally, such as the importance of economy-wide multi-year targets set well in advance, helping to define a clear yet flexible path towards long-term climate objectives. A strong independent body is critically important to ensure consistent project delivery and evidence-based decision-making. It is striking that Sweden's recently announced Climate Act replicates many of the characteristics and further illustrates the British leadership has led other countries to introduce similar legislation. So a number of factors enable the passage of the Act, including domestic and international momentum, an ambitious Secretary of State, and crucially, the supportive opposition. What has become a fractious and partisan issue in other countries has now reached cross-party cross consensus in the UK. Culminating in the re recent clean growth strategy, this highlighted one of the major successes of the UK transition to a low carbon environment. The fact that the UK has been among the most successful countries in the developing world in growing its economy whilst reducing emissions. This made clear that economic growth and the transition to a low carbon economy are no longer seen as mutually exclusive. This has been made possible by the merger of debt with bids, which has resulted in energy and climate issues being elevated to a much higher level politically and increased government buying across departments, although further work needs to be done in this area. In short, when in government, all of the UK's main parties have led on this issue. So the 10th anniversary of the Climate Change Act presents an opportunity to reflect on a pioneering piece of legislation and examine which institutional and legislative arrangements have been successful, where expectations have not been met, and what political challenges might arise to the act might arise in the future. In light of changing circumstances and the ratification of the Paris Accord, an important question to ask now is whether the central ambition of the Climate Change Act is sufficient in a post-Paris Agreement world. Indeed, the UK has recently tasked the Committee on Climate Change with advising the UK government on how it could achieve net zero, joining Sweden, Norway, and France that have either adopted a net zero target or are considering doing so. So the pace of decarbonisation in the power sector has been profound, showing that well-designed policy and a carbon tax can make a real difference. The successful deployment of renewables and switching from coal to gas has resulted in emissions falling by 62% from 1990, despite increasing demand. The UK total carbon price was enough to tip the balance in favour of natural gas, meaning that, you, that coal power has almost disappeared completely, with one estimate suggesting that the UK carbon price support alone has caused 73% of the reduction in coal generation from 2012 to 2016. So whilst the trajectory of the power sector decarbonisation decarbonization is clear, longer-term longer challenges remain. Taking into account existing and future policies, the UK is currently not on track to meet its fourth and fifth climate budgets, and there's a very real risk that under the current emissions trajectory, uh, current and national pledges, uh, global warming will exceed 1.5 degrees <coughs> above pre-industrial levels. 
So to address these international and domestic challenges and achieve net zero, potentially now needs to focus on the following. The future of, the future of carbon pricing, how we decarbonise and compete without penalising consumers, how to decarbonise industry without offshoring emissions, whether current technology is sufficient to decarbonise aviation and agriculture, and the extent to which technologies that remove CO2 from the atmosphere are feasible, scalable, and whether it's even appropriate to rely on such methods. Reflecting on how far we've come will hopefully provide us with some useful lessons for the next 10 years. So with that, I'll hand over to Ed and the all remarks. Um, well, thank you very much. And uh, can everyone hear me at the back? Uh, I just want to, first of all, thank Policy Exchange for uh, hosting uh, this event. I think one of the most important things about tackling climate change is that it, rem it is and remains uh, cross-party. Um, it's great, in particular, to have Lynn and Claire uh, on the panel as well. Um, if I can make this sort of observation, I think it's really important there is one person in government who really drives this. And I think sort of Claire's brief and the way she's gone about it, I think is really important because if I can put it slightly cheaply, you need to be a pain in the arse with all of your fellow colleagues in government. Uh, and I think both with her determination uh, on the subject and willing to be a pain in the arse with her colleagues, I think Claire is obviously serious about doing this and you know one of the things about climate change is you can be the climate change minister but you don't have the levers and you've got to engage with the treasury and, and others but but just more widely it's really important that this remains cross-party i'm conscious of time with, with five to seven minutes it's very hard for a politician to speak for five to seven minutes so I, I will try and be as brief as i can first of all we've come a long way in 10 years and i, I i'm not simply talking about the fact that the climate change act has been successful and emulated in other countries. I think we've come a long way in two particular respects. One in relation to the technology and the costs of the technology. The fact that onshore wind is now the cheapest or you know, equal to the cheapest technology that we have is remarkable. The costs of solar have tumbled massively. Um, and I think that's very, very good and very good. Provides us, should provide us with some confidence for the future. I think, secondly, the change in political will since I was the change, uh, climate change secretary internationally is incredibly striking. Leave aside President Trump for a second. Uh, I think, in particular, China and the way that the Chinese approach on this has been absolutely transformed in 10 years. You know, it is one of their biggest political priorities. They are installing more renewable electricity in the next uh, 15 years, I believe I'm right in saying, than the whole of Europe's electricity supply. I mean, the, the, the scale of seriousness in China about this is incredibly important, and the US states, uh, and so on. I think it's one of the reasons why Paris was a success, whereas Copenhagen wasn't. So we've come a very long way. Uh, unfortunately, the science is come a long way as well, and is pushing us to go further. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that 16 of the 17 hottest years on record have occurred in the 21st century. If you look at what happened in the Arctic, uh, last winter and the previous winters, it, it, it should alarm us. And of course, the real challenge of Paris is that it's got one and a half to two degree ambition, but probably three to three and a half degrees worth of pledges. And that's why I think we've got to raise our ambition domestically and also internationally. What, what do I want to see uh, domestically? I, I sort of coined this phrase, the sort of triple zero um, option, uh, zero net emissions, by 2050, which I think is basically where the science, and obviously Claire's right to get the Climate Change Committee to look at this, but I suspect that's probably where it will uh, come out. Um, zero carbon vehicles earlier than 2040. Uh, 22 years is too long to wait. Um, and we know that the transport sector is a massive challenge. And zero carbon homes, well, as soon as possible, new homes should be zero carbon homes. I mean, the, just, just as a sort of headline on ambition, there'd be three things that I would um, pick out. And the truth is that the Climate Change Act was ahead of its time, yes. but it's no longer ahead of its time uh, because other countries have caught up uh, with greater ambition. What is the challenge of, of doing those things? Because it's not very well sitting in a room where broadly people are committed to this uh, uh, issue. I would say that the, the one big challenge is that we haven't moved from enough from elite buy-in to popular buy-in on climate change. 
And I think we should be we should sort of acknowledge that. That isn't to say there aren't lots of people who care about this issue, but I think we've got a long way to go. And I think that that is around these issues of how you combine environmental justice for future generations with social justice and economic justice. And the truth is we haven't collectively focused enough on those things. You know, energy prices falling uh, you know, disproportionately on the poorest consumers, uh, the issue of jobs and what happens to people in jobs that are inevitably going to um, become less uh, relevant and important and, and, and useful in the uh, in near of low carbon, all of those things. I think that we need to take that a lot more seriously to get greater buy-in. And then re and sort of separately from that, uh, how we, but, but because the big challenge of climate change is the decisions we make now will have an impact on future generations, but they're not gonna have an impact now, at least in terms of the environment. But, but finding ways in which the decisions that we make on climate change also have immediate benefits like on prosperity, like on air pollution, I think is absolutely crucial. That closes the, the, if you like, the time inconsistency gap between people wanting benefit now and the benefits coming uh, later. Other thing I would say, it would be a strange meeting if we didn't mention Brexit, um, we mustn't forget the international dimension of this. We are about 1% of global emissions, I think I'm right in saying. Europe is about 10% of uh, global emissions. We have punched above our weight internationally, and including under this government, and that is a very good thing. But one of the reasons we punched above our weight is partly leadership domestically, so that we're on the, we, we've got some moral authority, but also Europe. You know, we negotiate as part of the European bubble uh, at the moment. Um, I think, just to add to Claire's workload, I think one of the really important things is what are the future arrangements that are going to protect British influence? Of course I care about British influence, but I also care about it because it is actually having a very positive effect. And I worry about us ending up a bit sort of floating sort of around without any kind of attachment either to Europe or, or elsewhere in terms of our... Um, uh, influence uh, and also um, the the development aspect of this remains important. You know, 0.7 percent UK aid policy is really important in this because we need a just transition internationally uh, as well. Last point I would make um, for those here who are from the climate movement is, um, you know, I, I think thinking about these issues of justice, social justice, economic justice, remains really important. But also, I think that the movement, if I can say this, needs to be louder, more annoying, and more problematic. Um, because, you know, people like Claire, I, I knew this from my time in government, having the movement causing you trouble as a government was a good thing if you were the climate minister. Because actually, it made it more likely that trouble was caused in the right way. I bet you didn't say that at the time. <laughs> actually, I did, not think. Uh, well, maybe I said it privately. Uh, 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 fair enough. But, but I, think, I think that is really important because I think, you know, you need to be pushed and government needs to be pushed. Um, so, so, you know, overall, I would say there are big causes for optimism. Um, but we are in a massive race against time, and this is the biggest national security, social justice, economic issue uh, that we face. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liv. Thank you, Josh. Um, okay, so um, what I want to say is when I was sitting in Parliament when we were leading the Climate Change Act through, and we voted it through, we all had cards from everyone, and I, I can't tell you how proud I was to be an MP voting it through. It's like, for all the rubbishing we politicians get, there are moments in Parliament when you are genuinely proud and you feel that you're doing the right stuff. And I have to pay tribute to you because that was the right stuff, and it was cross-party. And it literally changed the world. I mean, it really has been the benchmark from which we have all gone forward. So. Really a huge thank you to you, and also for making me feel quite good about being a politician, <laughs> which isn't always the case. Anyway, as we've gone on, I mean, we have been very fortunate in this country, because we've gone from Ed, Chris Hewn and Ed Davey, both brilliant secretaries of state in their time, and now Claire, who's a genuine greenie. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I have not had the chance to be Secretary of State, and it may not come. No, neither have I, just to be clear. <laughs> oh, well, indeed, indeed. But, minister, but minister, but minister in that indeed. department. But I was a minister in DFID, and we did an, a great amount of climate change and state social justice and international justice, incredibly important. But when I came into post, I think the thing that struck me most was um, there was a complete lack of urgency about what we were doing. Um, we had you know, this amazing Paris agreement with everyone signing, and it felt like the right stuff again. And we were all going to go to one and a half, hopefully, two degrees, and then nothing. There was no step change in our actual policy for what we were doing. And so, you know, uh, as a member of uh, the smaller opposition party, um, what was the most useful thing as, as a Liberal Democrat that we could do? And I thought, push the agenda, push the envelope. Now, the Liberal Democrats have always had zero carbon 2050 as our policy, but we've never been able to actually stand it up before. So uh, I raised some money um, and commissioned consultants to actually provide the evidence base of getting to zero carbon in 2050, because it's a great saying you must be net zero, but how do you do it? So it's very difficult is the answer we we made it um we used the climate change commission maps plus 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 to call the phrase um and we got and, then that, and this is doing everything from land management to counting in the peat uh peatlands everything you can possibly do and we were still seven percent sh short of zero carbon 2050. we say obviously over 30 years you can make up that seven percent from innovation and scale up on innovation but it is a hard task so as you say not only we're we going to miss the 40 percent carbon budgets but we are nowhere near having the policies in place that are going to get us to anywhere near zero carbon 2050 we have to be 80 percent by 2040 for sure so that was a, a huge part of what i was looking at and then as you mentioned brexit i will also mention brexit i mean of course this is a huge huge um, a challenge for all of us, partly because, as you say, we led in Europe. You know, we were able to lead Europe, and they were able to enforce us that fear to do what we said we'd do. And one of the big arguments, obviously, at the moment, is about the environmental principles being included, uh, which they have not been to date in our um, policy program and our law. Anyway, so I looked at Brexit, and of course, at a moment, to me, when our economy could be under threat. Um, I believe it will be under threat. I think it's the greatest act of self-harm since time began, but you know, I'm not going into the politics of Brexit today. But it seemed to me at a time that when the economy, the green economy, is growing at three times the rate of the normal economy, then, and um, forgive me, the government isn't always willing to fund everything that is needed, that we have to turn to the private sector. We have to get those investors. There is a lot of money swilling around the world looking for green projects to invest in because the returns are so good. And so there's a need to attract green finance. And I put on an event at the Stock Exchange uh, with Vince Cable. And the interest is huge in this. Um, so we have to be able to advertise ourselves to the world. And I would persuade the government, if I can, as I've got you here. To, to do something symbolic, like Macron in France, to issue a green sovereign bond, to begin as a national savings granny bond so the older generation can give to the younger generation a green, green national savings, to do something symbolic, and to not change the parameters by which businesses are working. Because one of the problems we've had in that is um, an undermining of investor confidence with the change in, um, I don't want to break the consensus of consensus, but um, nevertheless, that was a shock to the solar, uh, the solar energy world. Also, the, the carbon capture and storage, which is absolutely vital for zero carbon, um, that billion disappearing, I know they replaced it with 100 million, I think, but, you know, um, and investor confidence is everything, and that is an avenue where we have these great forcing mechanisms of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals on low carbon products, low carbon services are the markets that are growing. And we should be capturing that because we are world leaders, we can be world leaders, and we can make money. It's rare you get to save the planet and make money, people like to say. And then lastly, it really goes to something that Ed said, 
It's about engaging the people, engaging the people, and they are not truly engaged in climate change. They feel it, they support it, there's no longer an argument about it, except for Nigel Lawson, who I think offers it in the House of Lords, who often argues about it. Um, so engaging the people, and there are ways to do it. We've seen it, you know, the plastics thing has really caught the imagination. But I think also air quality is a great um, way to bring to bring it home, if you like. And the other great change in the disruption and energy revolution that we are going to experience is the devolution of power, literally, to the people. Um, I, this is where I make my officials really unhappy because they've written me a fantastic speech, but I'm not going to give it. So sorry, <laughs> I, I will pick through it and then uh, and actually respond to what I think are some incredibly important points. And you know, you won't be surprised to hear that it's a great pleasure as a minister to do something that you love and are passionate about, uh, following the footsteps of people who have really made a difference, and actually enjoy a, a rather a remarkable yeah. cross-party consensus. I mean, we do you know need each other about different things, but but also I think that sense of this being a vital part of all the cross-government policy and a realisation of both the opportunity and the international influence that we have is it, really fantastic. And I do have to pay tribute to Ed. I mean, um, of course, what I will say is I, th I believe it was one young Dean D Cameron who really lit the fire underneath this. Ed got... Ed got Dean Miliband, I thought you were well, going to say. I want Dean Miliband. He's got to be. Whichever D it was. Yeah. But it was actually this, uh, this gentleman who then persuaded his leader and chancellor that this was really worth doing, is the point I wanted to make. And it was a really remarkable act. And actually, my special advisor, Charlie Ogilvy, who many of you know, was one of the two official uh, uh, spads at the time in the Tory party who actually went through the act as well. So we've got lots of people in the room who were greatly relieved when it went through. Um, but it was a massive and momentous thing. And I look back now and I look at it from uh, the international perspective where you know I meet countries all the time who are both, both developed and developing who are struggling with how do you do something that's really tough that might not have a uh, political consensus or indeed public buy-in and make it stick how do you actually get successive governments to care about this and the structure of the act the setting up of our critical friends on the, on the climate change committee and the setting of budgets is a wonderful long-term forcing mechanism and, and we by the way and things like the commonwealth heads of government meetings offered up this capability um, to other countries we have the most transparent and best accounted for emissions um, inventory in the world we're really really good at measuring and monitoring and anyone involved in the current Tanaloa dialogue will know that this big challenge about transparency of emissions is vitally important you know 2020s when we really are going to have to say what our NDCs are and make sure we've got the measurement and monitoring positions in place to do that so so we really are in, in, in a you know from a structural and policy point of view uh, we're in a very very good place um, the other thing that have sort of come uh, apparent to me um, and it's a really important question is this kind of mix of you know managed markets policy levers free market, the kind of mix that you, you you pull together to deliver these policies. Now, we have the clean growth strategy. I mean, the carbon budgets, I mean, my, I, I've got a bet on, and I'll take it with anyone in the room, that we're at 90, 95, 97 and 95% towards meeting our fourth and fifth budget, which ended 28 and 32, respectively. Only 30% of the policies in the clean growth strategy have actually got carbon uh, budgets put against them. I'm pretty confident, given both that policy suite and the, uh, the cross uh, government support for this that we're going to hit those budgets and exceed them um, and as I say I have got I have got money in the game so um, I, want, I want that to happen not very much um, but you know <laughs> th but there is this, th this need to think about what are the mechanisms now Ed spoke about this and I think we've heard about this from Josh so in creating a carbon price signal we have dramatically decarbonized energy and only in the last few years I mean we, we are if people who you know want to look at what has happened to the emission spike from uh, the reduction from uh, from generation almost entirely as a result of the carbon price signal that brought forward uh, gas, cleaner gas, usually in modern plants, and kicked out coal, uh, which we want to phase out anyway. And it has been, and we're one of two countries in the world doing enough to hit a two degrees target as a result of actually largely that policy. Now that's, we can bank that, we've got lots more to do. But it's a really striking thing about if you can put a market signal in, what can, what can you do? But of course we can't just rely on, you know, you can't rely on markets. I'm a, I'm a sort of well-regulated free marketeer, but I think it's really important for government to set ambition and to set policies 
And there is an end, endless argument about what comes first, the market or the policies. I always go back to the uh, changes in the law around leaded petrol. It was actually California regulation that drove leaded petrol out of the mix, and that was the start of then a, a huge revolution. So there is a massive role for government to regulate and also to set ambition, and then to work on market structures. And, and both parties, um, uh, Ed in uh, his time and then Lynn through the coalition, the creation of our auction market for offshore wind has been an, an astounding success. I was on a, a boat with energy ministers a couple of weeks ago about mission innovation. We went from uh, Copenhagen to Malmo to Copenhagen, and I was um, being uh, whispered to by a representative of one of the world's leading offshore wind companies. They said, just ignore all this Danish rubbish. It's rubbish, rubbish. It wasn't until the British set that auction mechanism that the market started to fly, that that's when you really started to pull forward offshore wind. And by the way, Offshore wind is now being uh, opened in uh, Taiwan. The US have now made, announced their first offshore wind farm uh, off Martha's Vineyard. That technology is starting to fly as a result of a market mechanism created between the coalition government and companies, and we should be really proud of that. Um, but I wanted to focus on a couple of other things. I'm just rushing through to make sure I haven't missed. Oh, let me just think, talk about the coal thing. So as a result of the coal phase out, we've been able to then do something else, which is then go to the world, the powering past coal alliance, and say, you should be doing this. We're not going to let you. We know it's really tough. We know there are social consequences. But if we could do one thing, it would be to take coal out of the energy mix. So let's come together. We're now over 50 strong in the Powering Past Coal Alliance. I set that up with Catherine McKenna from Canada. Companies, states, um, uh, countries committing to phase out coal. And we're phasing it out uh, amongst some of the first countries to phase it out. And of course, in our energy system, remarkably, we can now see uh, that we are coal free uh, for days at a time, an unimaginable result. So we can take that domestic policy and turn it into international leadership. But I wanted to mention um, sort of three areas that are very much sort of what, what are consuming me. And actually, it's great to, to listen to some very good suggestions from other panelists. The first is. How do we move from the kind of theoretical pathway world into the practical policy world? Because there's an awful lot of talk about Paris, and you know, 2050 seems like a long time away, but actually if you're starting to put in place investment in policies, particularly in new technologies, it's not that far away. So that is why we've set up the Clean Growth Strategy. It's why we're investing heavily with 2.6 billion of R&D investment in my portfolio area, to say, what are those technologies we need to back we can keep talking about hydrogen, or we can start backing hydrogen and actually see if it, how it works in, in, in a heat network, how it works as a, as a, as a uh, fuel for heavy particular, I think it's very important for heavy goods uh, transport. Um, so let's get on and start backing some of these things and get into the practical world rather than the, you know, uh, we know we, we went to 100% electric, but frankly, how many people here cook with gas and use gas for heating? We are where we are. We've got to bring forward policies now, reflect that, but be very mindful of, of where we want to get to. Um, the second thing is, uh, and sorry, Lynn mentioned something very important, and in doing that, you capture a first mover advantage. So I'm very struck, I mean, I'm happy to talk about CCS, I think it's really important, um, but the world is now trying to work out how to use CCS. No one's cracked it, there's only 21 CCS plants that scale globally. No one's actually cracked how to do it. There is a massive advantage for the company that comes up with the right public private funding model and works out how to use that to decarbonize any industry. And there's a huge first mover advantage there. The second I talked about is this question of free market, managed market, mandation. What's the right mix? And, and how, and, and frankly, I, I'm not very ideological about this. I want to try things that work, and if they don't work, change them. So, you know, we have a great system for uh, now for bringing uh, renewables on via CFDs. We're getting to a world where we could be asking for zero or negative subsidy CFDs. That is a, a certainly a total possibility. Um, how do we need to, what do we need to do around building regulations, which is a huge issue um, in terms of improving building energy efficiency. But the, actually, the biggest pool of emissions we're struggling with is business uh, emissions. So some of it's coming from dirty processes that are really hard to decarbonize. Some of it's just that the average SME has too many things to think about than to think about their business energy uh, usage. And so how do, we, how do we address that problem, which I think in a way is often a B2B problem. And then the last uh, point, which Lynn quite rightly raised, is there is an unprecedented pivot in the world to understanding that clean and growth go together, and therefore this is an attractive opportunity for the private sector. Now, some companies have to do it. So if you look at the BP and the Shell, brilliant proposals for what they've got to do. 
you know, unless they work out a way to decarbonize what they're doing or indeed the turbine manufacturers, that is a fairly existential threat to their business, which is why they're so interested in investing. Um, but Lynn's point about green finance is absolutely spot on. The facilitation impact of green finance on this is huge. And I set up, and we may have people here, the Green Finance Task Force last year. The best, I mean, seriously, the best group in the world looking at all aspects of how you fund the transition and how you also create British expertise and, and an advantage from doing so. You know, we have the world's best insurance companies here. We have amazing climate analytic capabilities. How do we join this up and actually create a business? And that brings me back to my final point, which Ed uh, was right to raise, which is how do you get kind of cross government, across societal buying on this? And I think um, it's becoming much easier because what everyone has realized is the idea of deep decarbonization and economic growth are no longer opposing objectives. Actually, as Lynn said, the green economy is growing far faster than the uh, traditional economy. And crucially, the workforce of the future wants to work for companies that are doing the right thing and growing in a sustainable way with a lighter and lighter footprint and innovating and creating solutions for, for the planet. And so it's become an absolute win-win. So whether you are sitting there you know, around the cabinet table thinking about your portfolio, the one thing you know you need is a strong, strong growing economy to fund your particular service area. And people can see the opportunities for the UK in this space. And so actually, it's a brilliant time to be minister. I, I'm standing on the uh, so, so, or standing on the shoulders of giants, I feel, in this area. But there is a huge opportunity for us uh, from both improving and accelerating what we're doing, but actually making it business as usual as we go forward into uh, into the post-Brexit future. I'm not going to. We're not going to have a debate about Brexit. I suspect that that would be very dull for many people. But the, but there is a massive opportunity as we talk about trading relationships with the rest of the world to build in decarbonisation, but also build in the capture of intellectual property in the UK from all these great industries that we are investing in. And that's why I have the best job in Thank you. Not a politician, but pivotal in the success of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. um, I, I, I don't think I can add too much to what's been said, actually, but I do think it's important that we say something about um, what what has been achieved alongside this, which is a pretty remarkable governance arrangement that came through the Act. Um, and my institution, the CCC, is, is the product of that in many ways, but um, I, I, actually I think it's a celebration of what Parliament can do, so that, that would be my take on it. Um, I did want to say something about that. So, I mean, I think it's, it is pretty remarkable to have an institution like the Committee on Climate Change doing what it does. And I feel very privileged to, to run it at the moment. Um, we are, I suppose, the institutional part of the pain in the arms group. There's not that much pain around. I just want you to know about it. Well, wait till you see what we say next week. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I mean, this idea that we are the, this, it is, I think it is remarkable to create an institution like this to see with that, that genuine independence. And I do feel that when, when, we, when we discuss it. Um, it. It's great. I mean, I, I just want to, it's worth recapping on it. I mean, we have this situation now where the Act sets a long-term target to do something. Um, and, and we sit in the middle of this thing, uh, and very sensibly, when, when that act was created, the, the, I think it was quite proper, actually, that with the, there was deep consideration given to how you keep things on track. So long-term targets are easily ignored by parliaments. And this idea of a medium-term target over each five years being set by, you know, set by parliament, I think this is important to say, set by parliament on the advice of, of the CCC, uh, that being the carbon budget. And I think that is really what's kept this show on the road. Um, and it's, it's those carbon budgets, really, I think, that will, that will be so important in the future. I do think it's remarkable to have the CCC at the moment, that where we have that ability to set that target and have, have Parliament mandate it. The bit that's most interesting to me is that the government must respond to that target. And we're in the happy position in a market framework. So, you know, that... It, that Did I get an A? Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, you know, the other things that are just worth commenting on, we have a UK-wide role as well, and that's, a, a, when I think about, um, you know, when I was thinking about what I might say today, I don't know whether you would be able to create an institution at the CCC in the current political environment in the, in the UK as well, and I'm very privileged that, that we have it. Um, uh, we, we also have this role to look into the deep future, and, uh, and I, you know, that when it comes to thinking about the Paris Agreement, we're going to do that work. So. There's these two roles, the statutory role advising Parliament, 
but also an independent advisor to government. Uh, it really works, I think. Um, what's come of all that, I suppose, is also worth commenting on. We've heard a lot from the panel today about that, but <coughs> it, the UK has demonstrated that you can decouple growth from emissions reduction. So the stats this year are you know, 40% cut in emissions since 1990. The economy has grown by over 70% and that, you know, that is not the position that was being uh, that was that was considered a few years back. So you know, I think the challenge of continuing clearly is a big one, but that's something to be celebrated. The other thing I you know just want to comment on the, on my own institution, the CCC, is we have two chairs over that period. We have the Dear Turner and the Lord Haven, and that for us is, as an institution has been um, you know a tale of two years also. So Adair's job clearly was to set this thing up to be analytically rigorous, to be thought. And we've done that, and uh, I think, uh, I'm curious what the audience thinks to think about that, but the, the, and then the second era with Lord Deven is that we've, I think we've become more politically aware, but not politicised, so we're here keen to help you in your role across government. This idea that the stuff that's been done so far, potentially, is the easy bit. Uh, you know, the stuff that's next is hard. So when it comes to the UK position, these are deeply integrated questions of policy. Uh, you know, decarbonising the building stock, decarbonising agriculture, decarbonising the transport system involves clear in government advocating something that some of the some of some of those secretaries of state might not otherwise wish to do. So we want to be part of that process, giving you that ammunition. Um, and you know, these are really difficult things. Um, the last thing I, I thought I might talk about is is what's next. And I think it's worth considering the political environment when the act was passed. Uh, I, I absolutely believe there is continuing political consensus for, for this stuff 10 years later. But a question is whether there is the same political enthusiasm for it. So, you know, that I, I, I really do think that 10 years on, it is a good point in which to inject that enthusiasm again. All the great stuff that was achieved over the last 10 years has been on the back of that initial flush of the, the enthusiasm. There are two sectors in particular that have really, that have really come down in, in their emissions since then. That's the power sector and the one that's not often talked about the waste sector. Both of those sectors are the result of confident, ambitious policy making here in the UK. The next set of sectors now need to come on stream. So, I mean, the ones that we have in our sites clearly are, are, are transport, um, mm -hmm. buildings, the built environment, and one of the toughest sectors of all is agriculture and uh, how we use our land. We have demonstrated in the last 10 years uh, what happens when there is that strategic, bold, ambitious type of policy making. We know we can do it. We've demonstrated that the economy doesn't suffer when we do that. So I, I suppose my, my, parting, my parting message is to say that let's move that on now to a new set of sectors and be, be similarly ambitious in setting those long-term targets and standards that have allowed us to be the, you know, genuinely a you know, global voice in climate change. Um, I think if we don't do that, that, that position as a global voice is at risk. Fantastic. I thank you all for keeping to time. We've got plenty of time for the Q and A at the end. Um, one thing I want to ask—I know, I know there is cross-party consensus on the act itself—but um, if you put that to one side for one moment, is there any are there any policies that you think your government or those that have followed or succeeded yours that you would have done differently? Whether that's inheriting policies of more state intervention from next time, or uh, zero carbon homes during the coalition, or current decisions over onshore or offshore gas. So, yeah. uh, well, I, I want to be encouraging, but uh, uh, not um, uh, sort of critical. Um, I, I think I would just go back to, and, and I suspect Claire will feel this keenly herself, but it's what you can do in government. I, I, I just go back to this point about um, the scale of the challenge. I, I, think, I think it's good that we're all positive. Um, but we, we are in a race against time. We've seen one degree of uh, warming from uh, pre-industrial uh, averages already. You know, th there is massive urgency here. And therefore, so for example, you know, we sh I, I really think on, on car production, we just can't be saying we've got to wait till 2040 because it's just, it's just too far away um, to, to make the kind of difference we need to make. You know, on, on zero carbon homes, I think it's really important that that, is that, that policy is, um, is, is resurrected. I think the other point I'd make is just on this green growth, uh, is it called clean growth? Clean growth. Yeah, clean growth. I mean, I think that is a really important step because I think I think still too much if you think about what happens in government, 
climate is remains a you know it's it's the biggest challenge we face in a way, the biggest long term challenge, but it's an afterthought. If you take the Heathrow debate, for example, it tends to be, oh yeah, and then let's talk about the climate too. Oh. Whereas I think you know every, it, it's got to be integral to everything that's done, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes. Zero carbon homes, absolutely. I think I think I, I really didn't understand the removal of the zero carbon home standard. It seems to me with the huge emissions of, what is it, 27% from our buildings, if we can't build new homes right, retrofit is far more difficult. And I don't understand. So actually, I think you're, you're right. We have to be bold and ambitious. We've shown it can be done. So we need a Clean Air Act, and it's Clean Air Day today. Isn't it? Um, we need that urgently. Um, we also need a Green Buildings Act. These are all the dead policies, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, what's the other one I want to say? A Green Transport Act. And we also need to put our money where our mouth is. We, we, are, we have great innovators in this country, easy, but they can't scale up. And it's what you said, get on and do it. So get on and do it. Well, thank you. And uh, I think we might struggle to find parliamentary time for all, all of those. But let me tell you, in absence of what I'm sure a great idea is, there, there are three things. The first is I've sort of introduced, and it's an informal thing. So uh, don't, if people feel this is being unfairly applied, what to JR is, it's not being fully applied. But there's, I have a triple test now, which I think we probably could have usefully applied way back. And you always learn from what people done. Does something we're doing cut carbon? What does it do for consumer bills? cost-wise, and does it create a competitive advantage for the UK? And if I can take, for example, um, by the way, there's a big myth about consumer bills, which we address front and centre in the, the Clean Growth Strategy. So bills have come down since 2012, because whilst policy costs have been put there, and I present this as everyone investing in the transition to the future, and I accept that we perhaps, we perhaps haven't always done that in the most cost-effective way, but actually bills have gone down because of the increases in energy efficiency, sometimes directly funded by those policy costs, like ECO, which has led to more than two and a half million homes having their energy efficiency dramatically improved. Um, so, for example, with offshore wind, I would have been much more front-footed in getting supply chains onshore. And we have seen some of that. So we've got Siemens who are building a great turbine factory uh, in Hull. Uh, but a lot, what we've tended to do is offer bid out to whoever, because that's how markets work, without thinking about how do we capture the value from that investment onshore? And that's really changing now because of the industrial strategy, because clean growth is one of the four pillars of the industrial strategy. So working on things like the sector deal with the offshore wind sector to say, how are we going to do this together going forward? We want you in the mix. We want you to have that jobs and that IP in the UK. So I'm to the triple test. The second thing I would do is this issue of buy-in, you know, persuading people. You're both so right. It's the co-benefits people think about. They think about clean air more than they think about carbon, you know, because they haven't been up in the space shuttle and seen how thin the atmosphere is. Um, one of the things I'm really... Uh, but by the way, we know the public opinion is very supportive. The support for renewables has never been higher. Um, one of the things I'm introducing this year is Green GB Week, which we hope will be an annual event. The first one is in October. Uh, we're working on the programme. It's basically to say, we've done well. There's so much more to do. Here's how you can help, and, and uh, sort of a focus, as we've done with you with the New York Climate Week for many years, for businesses and innovators and uh, educators to, to focus on what we're going to do. And then the last thing I would mention, um, and we just talked about this, is this: I would be always thinking about the co-benefits because you know if you're doing, if you're decarbonising, you're kind of getting rid of coal, you're reducing smog, you're improving air quality. Um, it's the same thing with the car point, and, and actually always thinking about those cross-government co-benefits. You know, you're maintaining nutrients in the soil if you farm in a different way. Um, we talk about that a lot, but we don't always focus on it. And if I may, sorry, I have a fourth point very quickly. Um, I just want this debate to not be deep green people shouting at each other about nuclear power. I just feel for so often we've got into these deep green trenches, and I was in one for many years, where we become really fixated on a particular thing. You know, all fossil fuels are bad, we must have renewables. We're not going to have renewables plus storage that gives us what we need on the system, probably for 15 years. I'd love to be wrong. So what are we going to do now? And my sort of plea to, to those in the audience who I know do make themselves known and do like to bring legal challenges, which seems to me to be a grotesque waste of their donations and taxpayers' money defending them, but that's a separate point. Can we not just can we not just put ideology aside and recognise we're doing quite well? You're never going to persuade everybody that they should suddenly stop cooking with gas. And, and by the way, wouldn't that be an expensive cost? 
can't we just kind of work together a bit more cooperatively and put aside some of those deep green kind of uh, lumps that are thrown out of the trenches? And I wish we'd been a, perhaps a little bit more um, robust in defending the sort of the, the, the constant leaving that we get. It definitely works, but, but having everything the government does criticised by deep green groups, even though we're leading the world, does not necessarily inspire taxpayer confidence and they should be putting more taxes into deep green investments. Thank you. Um, I'll just add a couple of points, really, um, <clears throat> which is to say that we have done well in the last 10 years, and that's a really good thing, but we are resting now a lot on the power sector for the, for the continued decarbonisation yeah. that we've seen recently, and that's not enough, so yeah. we need to get beyond that sector into something else, and it really is now propping up the emissions reduction. In all the other sectors, um, it's a less happy story, so I know that I, you can view that one of two ways. One is to be depressed about it, and, um, uh, or you can be optimistic I am definitely optimistic let's get into it it's a really exciting time to be doing that and there are there are some pretty simple things that one can look at to, 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 to address some of those big sectoral challenges outside of power and a lot of them are not expensive so you know there's a the, you know, without spoiling the surprise next week one of the messages in our June report would be that there are low, low risk low cost measures that the UK can be implementing right now that will have that impact um, and, and the other thing I just want to say, because I think it's important, is that some of these big questions are big infrastructure questions. And in that time frame, you know, in the 2050 time frame that we often think of, these infrastructure questions are now. So um, I, my message to government, and indeed to all people around government, is to say that we, should, we mustn't be paralysed by those things. So I know there are big questions and big uncertainties about how to address these big system questions, but we've seen in the power sector and indeed in other sectors that when we act, now to give certainty to the market about where those decisions are heading, you see a positive short-term response. So I would like to think at least that we can be part of that process of, of shining a light on those infrastructure questions now and, 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 and clear to have the ammunition you need in government to make that happen. Fantastic. Right, so we've got 15 minutes for Q&A on the floor, which will be uh, plenty. So uh, the gentleman here uh, and the gentleman in the uh, white jacket behind, I'll take two of them. <coughs> You can say your name and organisation. Chris Bell, uh, Conservative Transport Group. Two quick questions, and maybe some more difficult ones. Uh, um, what nobody mentions emissions from <coughs> ships and the marine yeah. engines, or how aircraft are going to yeah. uh, decarbonise. And secondly, I'm very worried about the idea that we have all electric vehicles, but we've actually solved the problem because there's particulate matter, um, which is much more injurious to health, still given off by electric vehicles, and possibly more than ordinary vehicles, because they're 25% heavier. Thank you. It's Tim Crosland from the Charity for Plan B. Um, the government's now got the final version of the IPCC report into 1.5 degrees, and that makes clear two things. Um, first of all, that the consequences for humanity of exceeding 1.5 degrees are completely intolerable, including risks of tipping points and runaway climate change. And secondly, that to have even a sporting chance of avoiding that, the whole world has to reach net zero by 2050. So how is the UK going to help steer the world to that outcome unless itself as a developed country, historically high emitter, decarbonises significantly um, well, Chris, thank you. It's good to see you again. Thank you for your thoughtful contribution. I mean, I think you're right on, on ships and aircraft. I'm fascinated by uh, hype. So, first of all, um, we've seen some progress in the shipping in the maritime sector, which is good. Um, I uh, breakthroughs. It's hard to negotiate with that group. It's not enough. Uh, I'm interested in very much in hydrogen as a fuel uh, for shipping and actually for heavy transport because uh, you know it's not great at the moment with the way it's produced to do it with cars because it's a you know, it's quite you know, CO2 expensive but it could be a, a really good fuel for heavy uh, trains which you and I share an interest in. Um, aviation of course we put it into the um, ETS, I can't remember the date, so there is then a sort of trading thing and the, there is lots and lots of innovation. Uh, I saw the first Norwegian battery power plane of which one person can fit into <laughs> 600, so we may be a while. Um, but, I, but I think these are, and these are cross-government challenges, which relates very much up to, up to the second point. Um, so this is why, so there are very few countries who have actually 
developed countries, as we know, have sort of set out their zero. Uh, to, and by the way, you know, it's, it's much easier for Sweden to do so than ourselves. It's, a, it's just a very different setup. And um, we're not a very large manufacturing sector, uh, which we have to be mindful of. Um, but I think we have to face that face, as Lynn said, you know, what this actually looks like and then start framing our policies around it, but also use our climate finance because we are the second largest donor of climate finance in the world. So we take about five billion of our own commitment to put it into climate finance. And um, now there's always uh, questions and of course there's, a, as you know, a big discussion about, well, you created the emissions, just give us the money to, to adapt to them. Um, we want to be more creative than that and actually I'd love to see developing countries never go through coal, leapfrog coal completely and go straight to distributed renewables. Now, I don't feel I should sit here in the UK and dictate to people what their energy policies should be, but if we can help them to realise the benefit of distributed renewables with storage, which could provide absolutely enough power for many, many villages around the world, I would like to do that. So it's trying to, to be productive and helpful in our policy suggestions, backed up with a very substantial part of development finance. And on the party, I mean, yes, this is the this is constant challenge that we've got to face. And, and I don't know the answer, Chris. I'm not even going to try how we, how we deal with that. But we will be taking a lot of knocks out, which we know, again, today, we see is just such an incredibly intolerable pollutant to have, particularly in urban areas, particularly for young children. Hydrogen powered trams. <laughs> Heard it here first. <laughs> By the way, on H, sorry, hydrogen. What an amazing opportunity. So not only did we identify hydrogen in the Cavendish Laboratories in the UK, but we lead the world in electrolysis technology for splitting hydrogen out of water. I didn't know that until quite recently. So the opportunity to build a competitive advantage based on generation of H2 with renewables from water using UK um, R&D is absolutely there. And that's where I really want to be focusing on innovation. Um, yes, I, well, I mean, Chris, I, I basically said that in my opening, that there was no sense of urgency and we weren't going to make it. And we do have the opportunity um, to actually lead the world. Um, and the clean growth strategy and the industrial strategy were, were very ambitious and great. But as, as you say, it's a matter of getting on and doing it. And my, my problem, and it, now I'm being honest to myself to five years, I realize it really is a problem, is doing things in a timely manner because there really is no time to lose. And, um, you know, if you're going to think and consult and bring forward policy, it will be 2050 before we're taking the actual actions that could make us zero carbon. Now, I worked, as I said, for two years as a minister, and I went to Africa literally on a weekly basis. And it is phenomenal what can be done when we haven't already messed up the world, because there's huge opportunity there. I met, um, it always interested me, there were lots of, small entrepreneurs who are going around off-grid because the power company is not interested in most of Africa, which is off-grid. And they were setting up you know, a solar panel so there could be a lamp so the woman could sew and those students could study at night. But they were doing it on a sort of sky movie um, of, of rental. So they would put the equipment in and then you would pay maintenance for forever at a very low rate. But they were making they found a business model that actually made that work across Africa. And there were a huge amount of entrepreneurial um, zeal there, and I think we could learn a lesson or two from that. The world's first solar-powered fridge was in the Toy of Dippid last week, developed right here in the UK, being funded by UK Aid, um, and being the, actually done on a mobile phone pay-as-you-go model, which we know much of the developing world has. And not only the opportunity for cooling, the opportunity for medical improvement, so people you know, keeping insulin cool, Absolutely incredible brand, yeah, big stuff, fantastic. transformational, being invented here, and being funded lead, by UK. And they have the opportunity to lead from us yeah. and not make all the mistakes that we've made. Would you like the audience just to just short the time? Yeah. I'll take a bunch of three. So the, the lady here in the front, uh, the lady in the blue dress on the left hand side, and then the gentleman uh, just behind. Um, local water is being well energy solution. Um, I'm just wanted to uh, ask you a question really about uh, cooperation, collaboration. Why organisations of nature are most of them with the cost of hydrogen um, in their different sectors? And um, it's good to see the work in the environment and community where we have experienced this already before, sitting on the same panel as um, Claire and uh, Chris. I just wanted to say in Parliament, how are you guys working together 
Research Institute at the School of Economics. Um, uh, many of the panelists have referred to the need to get the public on the side and make this more of an issue. Um, there is uh, public survey information that shows that there is widespread concern, but the level of understanding is very shallow. For instance, the majority of the British public think that the risk of heat waves in the UK is going down. Um, so, is it time? For the Climate Change Act doesn't create a statutory responsibility to communicate to the public about climate change. So is it time for government to have a media partner that is responsible for leading on public communication about climate change risks? The Committee on Climate Change has recommended that a couple of times to government now and it's been rejected each time. Is it time to change that? Forgive my ignorance. Just, just what, what, what was the recommendation? A lead department. A lead department on communicating to the public about the risks of climate change. Right. I mean, first of all, Grantham does brilliant work, um, and I think it's right to um, acknowledge that. Yet, I mean, yes, to, is it the answer to your question? I think um, when, when I was the um, Secretary of State, we did various communications um, on this. Some of which were more successful than others. Um, but I think I think it's a really good point about. You know the outward-facing nature of, of, of government. How exactly it's done, I don't know, but I think it's really important. On aviation, I think it's really good you ask the question. I think I'm right in saying that one of the flaws of the Climate Change Act is aviation emissions are not included in the overall numbers. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I mean, as we think about the Climate Change Act going forward, particularly if we, as I hope we do, move to net zero, we've got to put that right because it is a really big, um, it is a really big emission. Um, uh, you know, and it was. So I think to do with the measurement issues, but I mean, I think it does need to be, we need to do something about it. Um, and look, it goes back to the question that Chris at the front asked, you know, I'm afraid aviation and shipping, but aviation is really an uncracked problem in this, because basically it goes back to this afterthought point, I'm not just talking about Britain here, which is, well, we're going to just carry on expanding aviation, more or less unconstrained is the sort of, is the basic view, and oh yeah, there's a sort of climate problem. And and as the, as we cut emissions more elsewhere, aviation becomes a bigger and bigger part of the problem. And so I think it's, you're, completely, um, uh, you're completely right on that. On finally, just on the, should we be working together more? We don't enough, and we should. <laughs> Chris, do you want to answer something? Yeah, why not? I, I take the aviation point. So we do, I mean, we the, there is an accounting issue about aviation emissions, but we, I mean, we, um, we do make an assessment of aviation's place as a sector emitter. And we have been generous put it mildly to the aviation sector. So what we've what we've permitted in our future assessment is effectively sixty percent growth in demand for aviation. And we haven't done that for any other sector. And I suppose the beauty of the Act, just to be positive for a second, is that the Act permits that entirely. You know, basically if one sector wants to wants to emit, then other sectors have to overshoot. And that's effectively what we've been modeling. So we've got in, in our modeling um, an assessment that aviation emissions will return to to two thousand and five levels, which is an enormous uh, uh, you know concession actually. But that you know that was that is a 
I think, a very important point of how the Act works. Um, we, one of the great things with being independent is that we can, you know, we can, we can make clear these points to government. And we wrote to um, Chris Greenlee last week just to highlight that that was indeed our assessment. And also to flag that we are intending to look again at aviation uh, over the course of the next nine months or so. So we, this point about us being politically aware is that that's an important thing for us to do because we know the DFT are producing a new aviation strategy. So we want to make sure that we provide that analysis in advance of that. So I think the, the short answer, this is not a short answer, but the long answer to your question is that we look to that work when it comes next year. And I, and I think that's why having the CCC is so important because it enables us to have that dynamic assessment and also as we solve or, or you know, as we've heard about, we decarbonise one sector, then how do we focus on, on another sector? I think it's I want to, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I do think you've got to go. Ed, I invited you to come and make a video with me about you know, the 10th anniversary. I, I will, I'm totally agnostic about who wants to come and talk to me about whatever kind of issues they're facing, partly because I, I, you know, we can, we can all have a knockabout in politics, but ultimately you can't get have the House of Commons or the House of Lords to agree. And there are multiple all party groups that meet on all sorts of issues which we engage with. And um, and of course, you know, the night, in a way, when you're not in government, you have the luxury of focusing on a particular issue rather than trying to balance everything in the round. And that's why government can be more sometimes than we'd like it to be. But, but I, I think we do work well together. And there are really good um, you know, cross-party campaigns. And also people who then leave this place as politicians who go on, like Greg Barker, who had my job, who has been a brilliant person on the international stage. Polly Finnington's another one who runs UK 100. Uh, people who are just fantastic and who we work with really well. So I think I do would like to think that continues. Um, on the question about um, uh, the Grant Institute, I think I don't think we should have a statutory communications obligation. I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, there are many threats to uh, life in the country, and I am with Ed in thinking this is the kind of threat that we can only solve through collective action. But we could say we should have a statutory obligation to warn people about the dangers of smoking. There should be a mandatory government department because we know that smoking kills, right? So, and also, so I don't, and I don't think that's right because I think we would then get into a horse train as to what was really important for people to know. And secondly, I just don't think. Regardless of all the brilliant people working government, government's very good at communication. You know, we can tell people every, we can tell people until we're blue in the face about don't take plastic bags from the supermarket until we put a five p charge on them. Utterly trivial, nothing happened. That was a policy that has led to eight billion fewer bags being used. So I think governments, are, and I would much rather have companies and trusted brands and campaigning groups and citizens advice communicating about this. The WI, amazing institution full of climate ambassadors, they will do a much, much better job than any politician will ever do. Because who do, who do the public trust? Politicians? No. But you know, the WI? Yes. So I think actually what I'd rather do is focus on the policies and the ambitions that shift the dial, the complex transactions that we need to put in place to get the world really moving in different spaces, and energize the country, this is why Green GB Week is hopefully a chance to do this, about why we need to act on this. So, so I would not agree with statutory obligations because I just don't think we do a very good job at it. Thank you. Okay, so um, working together, when it comes to legislation, there is a lot of, well, there's a, generally a lot of cross-party working in where to test the government and where to grow back from that. But, but generally there is, I mean, I suppose in the Lords it's, um, more harmonious at times, but also it's more separate. I mean, I don't know what the across the view um, and I'm afraid we are reduced in our number in the Commons, so that makes it difficult to cover everything, but we still have Ed Davey in the Commons who stands up that way, which is really nice. So, in terms of Heathrow, obviously if we look there we would just say no, but, but I think more deeply, that aviation policy is very superficial. It doesn't really deal with the problems. I mean, no one's saying you should have no aviation, Sorry, but you need to spread it around the country and you need to make it clear. <coughs> you know, if you always feed the monster, you get a very big monster. That's all I would say on that. <laughs> and in terms of um, a voice, uh, a communication, statutory, I remember, I don't know if it was during the Climate Change Act, but it was certainly during that parliament. Uh, when we were discussing Al Gore's film. And I remember standing up and saying, this should be shown in all secondary schools, because it was so amazing. And your, your government said, yes, I don't know if it happened, to be honest. Sure but, it did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. Um, but the point I'm making is there are things 
spread a word propagating. It's how do you judge what is propagated and by whom and whether it will be believed. So I think it would be good. I actually think this is such a threat to the world that the government should be saying these things statutorily. Um, because I think you lead, you don't follow. But Lynn, so the thing that's moved the dial on plastics is Blue Planet. Right, so the reason we've suddenly, everyone is now supportive yeah, of plastics is because David Attenborough, with the wonderful BBC, did an amazing thing that said, oh my God, we need to do something about it. We've been talking about plastic waste forever. The thing forever. that moved the dial yes. on um, LGBT with civil partnerships and then Green Act. It was campaigners and then the government made it law and change happened. Law can be a guiding thing and says yes. things can be a guiding thing. And it's government's job to lead. Okay, I'll take John on the research page. Anyone in the back, I've not got to. Um, right. Check shirt at the, the very back in red. Uh, Jonathan Lee from the Environment Center for the Summer Times. And uh, this is really about carbon accounting. Um, if you look at the climate change commission's um, figures for what we, um, for our emissions generated by consumption in the United uh, they're about 1.1 billion tonnes of CO2. And if you look at the uh, figures that are recently, I think, for Treasury and CCC, <coughs> for what we emit now, uh, it's about 1.1 billion tonnes. And the reductions that we've achieved in our domestic emissions uh, are to some extent due to the offshoring of manufacturing. Um, wouldn't it be more accurate to look at what we're producing through our consumption? Thank you. And finally, the, the gentleman at the very back in the red check shirt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mark Robinson from Inter Tech Marine. And I appreciate you say care about um, getting campaigning groups to raise awareness of the issue. Um, one thing that we're trying to raise awareness of right now is the issue of fracking. Um, I'm aware, I know that you say that it's a controversial area, but um, one thing that I would say is that there has been set out by the Climate Change Commission three tests on how the government should meet these, otherwise commercial scale fracking is impacting with our climate change targets. Um, unfortunately as well, now that we're seeing um, uh, a kind of a government shift towards um, moving towards allowing fracking to happen easier. It's slightly concerning given that we really should be reassessing this evidence right now, um, especially now that we're moving towards uh, a net zero target. Um, shouldn't we be waiting um, to get the, shouldn't we really be waiting to kind of assess this evidence and um, action on that before giving the green light to this industry on such a large scale that's happening right now? I don't know what the CCC says about the carbon accounting point, but is that, is that Jonathan correct? Uh, yeah, and it's more or less a flat line. But there, I mean, there are a few points about the data, which is it's not always not always easiest data to look at. Um, but I mean, it has, and I think it has come down. I was just looking to see if I could find it. I think it has come down slightly, but I mean, the, the point stands absolutely. Was that right. 1990, Jonathan? Yeah. So if you look back to the Climate Change Commission report, which you may not see. Then in 1990, it's roughly 1.1 and 1.2 billion tons. And I think it might, might be a slightly worse analysis. Yeah, but GDP's gone up 67% since then. So you could argue that. I mean, so I told you. Most of this is a fraud. Well, so, so, so there's two questions. So, first of all, if, so the Paris Agreement, so we all have to. So, so those emissions should be counted somewhere. So at the moment, we count where they're produced, I think. Is, and this is part of the challenge, by the way. We don't count any of the emissions we achieve. Through our climate finance, because we don't score them again, even though it's, they're scored where their emission reductions happen. So, if you assume that the world gets to a point of having transparent and good um, inventory, so that is a huge challenge, then those will be counted because one ton of CO2, regardless of where it's emitted, has the same impact on the atmosphere. So, so I think it's an important point. But again, I, you know, given how much we've grown the economy since then, and I don't know what. Yeah, we've my, grown our financial sector, not our manufacturing sector. Well, but we've, so we've got to increase GDP. But the financial emissions. But it's great, actually manufacturing is now going back up, which is great, but it's still a, what is it, less than 15% of the overall economic base. So, I mean, the, the challenge, by the way, for CO2 reduction for manufacturing is not consumer goods, it's heavy industry. So we need to decarbonise steel, cement, 
um, you know, tiles, ceramics. That's really tough, and that's what I think we should be focusing on. I mean, on the shale point, um, I mean, I, you know, so for me, I spend most of my life trying to persuade people to do things because of the science of climate change. And I am persuaded that we should be testing these scientific questions around shale gas extraction. We need gas in our mix. Every, every pathway the CCC has proposed suggests that we will be using gas. We have the best environmental regulators in the world, and those are the people who are quite rightly tasked with the tests that the CCC has said would need to be met for shale to be appropriate. And I am, you know, if we have a resource that is sovereign, uh, that is consistent with a low carbon future, particularly if you could decarbonize, and can create economic potential, particularly in areas, formal coal mining areas, where jobs and growth are preciously hard to find, I think we should test those. And I'm not, you know, we're not going to have energy policy in this country made by ideology. And I'll tell you why. Because I sat in the COP in Bonn last year with the Germans watching tons of lignite coal go down the Ruhr past the COP site. Basically because energy policy has been made by ideology. So guess what's happened to German emissions? They're going up. We need to be better than that, scientifically understand these things, make decisions on, a, on an iterative basis. We're not in a kind of dash for shale. We, are, we don't even have one production one at the moment, but we're gonna make energy policy based on cost, carbon, what's right for the consumers, and how we can create competitive advantage. And, and I'm afraid that's where we are. That was the manifesto commitment I got elected on. That's what I'm gonna deliver. Thank you. Just briefly, on, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna come back on fracking because I, I think it's a complete and utter distraction to where we need to be going. And I think, it, I think it's the government relying on private money coming in and filling the gap between where we are and where we need to be with a fossil fuel. I think our geology and geography won't deliver what, you know, certainly the Lord's energy minister thinks is going to be the economic miracle that America has, although America years on is finding that it wasn't uh, what they thought it would be. Moreover, just, just this, uh, and in the coal mining district has just been brought out to show how dangerous it is in the coal mining district. But this morning, but, but the, I just, I meet all these. So every academic I've met who's published a report so far on fugitive methane emissions and seismicity is actually anti-gas. They don't want gas in the mix at all, whether it's onshore or offshore. That is well, true. Well, I, I was going on academics who I don't think came from that position. This morning, there was a, a, a report that the Royal Society, on whose uh, report the, I think the Climate Change Committee or the government were relying in terms of the job, is now going to review its position and produce a new report, a number of years after that first one, and that £7.6 million pounds is going now into researching the actuality of fracking since that last report. So, my call to the, the government would be you know, you are saying it can be permitted development so it can go ahead because local people who you said would have a say in it are going to have that say in it. Consultation. Can't, it would need legislation in Politicians will decide that. I'm simply yeah. saying that local people want to be able to have a voice and now if permitted development goes ahead that voice will be removed. Uh, but as I say the biggest <coughs> thing is we need the government to be getting on with filling that gap not with another fossil fuel, but investing in the renewables, which really are. But we can't run. So, we so can't yeah. run an energy system now or for the next twenty years on current or proposed renewables plus storage technology. We just can't. And and you know and so if uh, we can't, so so we are. So you're investing in nuclear. So so well, that's a, another so ideological right. question. And Germany have kept it. By the way, who are buying nuclear from France are burning shed loads of coal because of that decision, which is crackers. But again. If we can decarbonise gas, and we haven't talked about CCS, which I could talk to all day, then we would be crazy not to keep gas in the mix. Who here doesn't have a gas cooker? Oh, brilliant. About 10% of the audience. Anyone here use gas to heat their homes? I can't because I'm off grid, which is a problem I've got to solve. But for goodness sakes, we have an opportunity to develop a resource. By the way, it's incredible to me that some parties support offshore gas production, like of our friends north of the borders and then have these bizarre science free moratorium. We are not going to have energy policy in this country. It's too precious. We've done too much set by an ideology. Cost and carbon, security and competitive advantage is what we're going to do. And if people don't like it, 
don't vote for us. Thank you. On, on that note, I'm going to have to call the time. So I'll just say, I'd like to say a massive thank you to our panellists and to the sponsors of the European Climate Foundation and the Energy and Utilities Alliance for helping put on this event. So round of applause. Thank you.